And the boys, they sailed away, and they made a sight so glorious as they marched along Broadway. They marched right down Broadway, me boys, until they reached the shore. And from there they went to Washington and straight on to the wall. So we gave them party cheers, me boys, which was greeted with a smile. Singing tears of ice that fear no night, where the fight in 59. And when the war is said and done, may heaven spare our lives. For it's only then that we can return to our loved ones and our wives. We'll take them in our arms, we buy for a long night and a day. And we hope that war will come no more to sweet America. So we gave them hearty cheers, me boys, which was greeted with a smile. In the tears of boys who feared all night with a fight in 69. So farewell unto you, dear New York, will I ever see you once more. For it fills my heart with sorrow to leave your silver shore. But the country now is just calling us, and we must hasten home. So here's to the stars and stripes, me boys, and to Ireland's lovely shore. And here's to Murphy and Divine, a farmer and renowned, who did escort our heroes unto the battleground. And said unto our colonel, we must fight hand in hand until we plant the stars and stripes way down in Dixieland. So we gave them party cheers, we fight with the greatest with our fight. Singing cheers of fight who fear no night where the fight in Dixieland. So we gave them party cheers, new artists which was greeted with a smile. Singing cheers of eyes who fear no night, where the fight in Dixieland. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sanibel Public Library. My name is Dwayne Schaefer, and I'm head of the collection development for the library. And uh, we're doing something a little different today. Uh, we have been doing World War II uh, most of the time, but we're going to change gears on our time machine today. And we are going to go from the 1940s back to the 1860s. And it's very interesting to note that today, April 9th, is the uh, 156th anniversary of the end of the war. And of course, on the 12th, that is the um, beginning of the war in 1861. Uh, a couple of program notes I'd like to uh, let you know about. Um, on April 30th, three weeks from today, we will be doing the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg and we will be joined um, with my wife here. She will be uh, helping us out with that presentation. Then on May 14th, we will conclude uh, the Battle of Gettysburg um, with day three. And um, the last program we're going to do is going to be um, May 28th, and that is the Battle of Fort Myers. Believe it or not, there was a Civil War battle in Fort Myers. Um, first of all, I would like to, whether you're live or you're gonna watch this later, 
I'd like to recognize um, all the Civil War Roundtables of America, especially uh, the one that I came from, Civil War Roundtable of New Hampshire, getting it done since 1991. They're going to be celebrating their 30th anniversary next month. There's no time like the present to meet us in the past. Um, for, uh, next, I'd like to uh, have Danny come up and uh, He's the guy who gets it all done. Put your head down, Danny. He's the guy that gets it all done, uh, all this great technology for us. Uh, if you're going to be in the library uh, this month, we do have a Civil War um, display and a book display, uh, the display of memorabilia in uh, the display case. If you're going to get some books, uh, you're going to go to the 973.7 area of the library. That is where you will find the uh, Civil War books. So let's get started, Danny, and uh, we're going to get the program going here. Okay, uh, for those of you who are wondering what our background is all about, any of you who have a little bit of um, background on the Civil War, this is the Chambersburg Pike. And uh, this is going to figure very prominently in the uh, first day's battle. Uh, but before we get to that, we want to do a little bit of background to bring you up to speed on how we got here to July 1863. Of course, the battle, um, the Civil War began uh, at Fort Sumter with the firing there. And uh, there were battles that occurred after that first bull run uh, the Shenandoah Valley campaign, second uh, Bull Run and uh, Antietam, Fredericksburg. And these are all battles that did not go so well for uh, the Union. But we're going to... Uh, not getting the next slide there, Danny. Oh, yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. What does Grant have to do with... Gettysburg. Well, he, uh, out in the Western theater, he was having uh, a good deal of success. Of course, he made his name at the Battle of Shiloh, which occurred on April 6th, 1862. That was uh, the beginning of his rise uh, to fame. And then he uh, had uh, great success in several battles leading up to uh, the Vicksburg campaign. Now, Everything was going well for him out in the West. However, not so good in the uh, East for the Union. As I indicated, uh, the, they lost the Battle of Fredericksburg and they were going to lose the Battle of uh, Chancellorsville, which was May, 1863. And uh, in that month of May, 1863, a lot of things are going on. General Longstreet, who was down there in the right-hand corner. He went to Richmond to talk to President Davis and to Secretary of War Seddon. He had the idea that if troops, some of his uh, troops were sent out to uh, reinforce uh, Joe Johnston and Pemberton and Vicksburg, that that could be of uh, great help. He wanted to go west and Davis, he was in favor of this. Seddon was also in favor of this, and um, they thought that this would be a good idea. But guess who else had a meeting? Robert E. Lee also had a meeting with Davis and Seddon. Now, of course, as you probably can guess, Robert E. Lee carried a lot more weight. His reputation was solid. He just came off of a stunning, stunning victory at uh, Chancellorsville, and his reasoning was that if they sent troops west, that would endanger the, um, uh, the campaign in the east. He recommended a second invasion of the north. He said that if they could invade Pennsylvania and draw those Union troops out of Virginia, perhaps that would cause Grant to ease up his pressure on Vicksburg, bring some of those troops east, However, foreign recognition, pretty shaky at this time, but he was hoping that with a Southern victory that France and England would perhaps recognize the Confederacy. And just maybe if 
the Union Army, the Army of the Potomac were able to be drawn out, up into the open and defeated in detail that the Lincoln government would then sue for peace. But there was a lot going on in Washington. Tension in the ranks after Chancellorsville. Why? Because Joseph Hooker, who was in charge of the Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville, lost that battle. Now I say tension in the ranks because Hooker was not really well liked by a lot of the other generals. Lincoln really didn't like him as well. Uh, a lot of this came from when Hooker first took command and he uh, sent a letter to Lincoln saying that he would recommend a dictatorship. And Lincoln said, I'm going to let you be ahead of the Army of the Potomac and we'll deal with that dictatorship later. But Hooker had a lot of ideas about how he wanted the next campaign to go. He said, if Lee goes out into the open, if he goes up into Maryland or any further, I can sneak around. I can sneak around and take Richmond. And Lincoln says, and Stanton says, you're not going to Richmond. And when they're in the field, Hooker sends another note. He says, I think we should evacuate Harper's Ferry because there was a garrison there again. And he felt that if he had those troops, the more troops, the more soldiers, the better uh, that would help him. And Lincoln says, we're not going to evacuate Harper's Ferry, so forget it. And Hooker says, all right then, I resign. And Lincoln said, okay, no problem. Resignation accepted. So what he did, he, Lincoln sent a courier up to the Union camp with orders for the new commander, George Gordon Meade, Pennsylvania man. He sent the courier up and he went to Meade's tent first and he told Meade, you're in charge of the Army of the Potomac now. And Meade wrote to his wife and said something like, I've been tried and convicted and now obviously I'm going to be executed because everybody in the Union camp knew that there was a battle coming. Little did they know it would only be a couple days from then. So George Gordon Meade is going to be commander of the Army of the Potomac, recently the head of the Fifth Corps. So now where was Stonewall Jackson at this time? You notice I have didn't say anything about him. Well, where was Jackson? Well, on May 2nd, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, Jackson on that evening was riding with some of his staff through the lines to see if they couldn't push the Union Army any further. And unfortunately, he was fired upon by North Carolina troops in a friendly fire incident, and Jackson had to have his arm amputated. Unfortunately, eight days later, Jackson dies on May 10th, 1863. Lee is now without his ultimate uh, commander because there was this symbiotic relationship between Lee and Jackson. Lee could almost think his orders and Jackson would pick up on it. Jackson would carry them out. And this loss, this incredible loss to the Confederacy was going to have extreme repercussions in the battle ahead. So who is, what is Lee going to do? First, before the Battle of Gettysburg, there were two Southern Corps. Lee decides to then create a third corps. Of course, James Longstreet is going to be in charge of the first corps, as always. Richard Yule is now going to be in charge of Jackson's old corps, the second corps. The new corps that Lee creates is the third corps under Ambrose Powell Hill. And this is also going to create uh, some issues later. Someone who you're probably waiting to hear me say something about is this man, 
James Yul Brown Stewart. Stewart was riding and supposed to protect Lee's right flank. As we'll see in the next slide, the beginning of the Southern campaign begins on June 3rd. So we'll go to this in a second, but after a while, Stewart gets further and further away from the Army of Northern Virginia and is on the other side away from Lee and the Union Army is between them. And Lee keeps saying to everyone that he meets when they're on the march, he says, excuse me, have you seen my cavalry? And nobody can say that. But something happened on June 9th that caused this also to happen. The Battle of Brandy Station on June the 9th. Now here's a very busy looking map and we're going to stay on this for a couple of moments. If you look all the way down in the bottom, you see uh, where it says June 3rd. That is where the Army of Northern Virginia begins its march on the outskirts of Fredericksburg. They start moving towards Culpeper Courthouse. And just before uh, June 9th, June 7th, June 8th, Stuart holds a grand review of his cavalrymen. In great numbers, they, they ride past several times. They had several reviews. And the last review, Lee actually attended himself. But what happens in the next few days, Pleasanton's cavalry, the Union cavalry, they catch up to the Southerns at Brandy Station. And there is an incredible, incredible fight. A lot of fighting of dismounted cavalry, a lot of charges, a lot of counter charges. Um, long story short, the Battle of Brandy Station ends up being pretty much a tie, pretty much. But what happens is that the Union cavalry, which up to this point had, be, had been considered inferior to the Southern cavalry. Well, under cavalrymen like Buford, Gregg, and Kilpatrick, they hold their own in this battle and actually give Stuart a bloody nose. So what I was talking about before in the previous slide, Stuart now has something to prove. And what he's going to do is he is going to ride off on his own and cause as much trouble to the Union as possible. Unfortunately, he, again, as I indicated, he's separating himself from Lee. So what happens in the next days after June 3rd, June 9th, the Confederates, they move up through the uh, Shenandoah Valley. They go down the valley towards Winchester. Yule, who is now in charge of that second corps, he's got a lot to prove too because he's got those big giant boots of Stonewall Jackson to fill. And he actually does very well at the second battle of Winchester kicking out General Milroy and his troops. Well, the Southerns, they continue down and they go to Shepherdstown and through Harper's Ferry, and then they start crossing the Potomac. Well, somewhere along the line, the Union uh, troops, they catch up on this and they start moving north as well. Their chief goal is to stay between Lee and stay between Washington because they don't know what Lee's plans are. They don't know if he's going to go to Washington and attack it, or if he's going to Baltimore and attack it. They really didn't think he was gonna get up all the way up into central Pennsylvania or go east to Philadelphia. They weren't sure about that, but what they were sure is that Hooker was charged with uh, keeping Lee away from Washington or Baltimore. Now, as I indicated, Hooker was replaced by General George Meade. This is a man who starts uh, trying to uh, get his troops into position. He's trying his best to uh, stay between Lee and those cities of Washington and Baltimore. And all the way up, as you can see, almost to the top, we have 
Ewell's troops, they are all the way up at Carlisle. Early it is all the way over almost to Wrightsville, which is on the Susquehanna. What their goal was at that point was they wanted to cut the bridges over the Susquehanna so that the Union troops could not be supplied from that position. Lee, as always, very difficult to give direct orders. He almost always would imply what he wanted to have done. Yule was already all the way up there, ready to take Harrisburg. And then something happens in the camps of Longstreet. Longstreet has a scout. On the other side, he would have been called a spy. The Mississippi man by the name of Harrison brings Longstreet and Lee news that the Union Army is very close by. Seven Corps. Of course, at first they didn't believe him, but then once it was verified, Lee starts sending out orders for the Army to come together. And they are at Chambersburg. They start moving towards Cashtown. And of course, Lee wanted to have all of them come together. He selected Gettysburg because of its road network. It's a hub. And he felt that everybody could come back together um, there. So he called Ewell back. He called Early back. They all start converging on Gettysburg together. Now, here's a sign. And those of you who know the Gettysburg battlefield know that this is very close by uh, where you see on the bottom sort of left-hand side, that is part was part of um, Lee's headquarters. This is a sign that's very close to town. However, the battle actually on July 1st did not start right there. It started further, further out on the Chambersburg Pike, which we had our background picture. Further out on the Chambersburg Pike, about three or four miles, where uh, General Buford, Brigadier General Buford, had his um, scouts, had his vedettes out that far because they knew the, the Southern Army was out there and they wanted to keep very close tabs on them. Now, we're going to talk about a couple of different things along the way. And I have a picture of Brogan just down there. And it's like, what about those shoes? Well, here's the, here's the truth about that. I mean, there's a lot of myth and a lot of lore that the Battle of Gettysburg was over shoes. It was not over shoes. In fact, General John B. Gordon and his men actually had gone through Gettysburg several days before that. And as I said, Gettysburg is a hub. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth with the Southern troops, a lot of back and forth with the Union troops. And actually, there was no shoe factory in Gettysburg. There was actually more shoes to be had at the town several miles over in Hanover. But that's how the rumors begin. And actually, the myth about the shoes really didn't take hold until about 10, 20 years after the war. But getting back to where the battle actually began was up on Knoxland Ridge. Now, many of you have never heard of that. But if we look at the um, Chambersburg Pike, it's going to be way, way out there, about three, four, five miles. And again, that first day's battle is all about those ridges. The Knoxland Ridge then Hare's Ridge, where Hare's Tavern is located, and then McPherson's Ridge, and then Seminary Ridge. And there is actually a marker there, and it says 730. That's, that's pretty accurate. And it said that uh, Marcellus Jones uh, was the, supposed to be the first man who fired the first shot. However, there were also Pennsylvania Cavalry and New York Cavalry and they kind of disagree about that, but we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that. Who is out there? Who is coming in from Cashtown? Well, it's gonna be AP Hills Corps that's gonna make contact first and is going to be General uh, Henry Heath. 
who is going to make the first contact. Now, there's been orders given to Henry Heath that uh, he, nobody is supposed to bring on a general engagement until all the troops have come together. These were Lee's actually express orders that that was not supposed to happen. But General Heath, his men are going forward down the Chambersburg Pike and they start meeting the, uh, the um, vedettes of Buford and the skirmish starts to begin. And then one regiment after another starts feeding in. Regiments under James Archer, the 1st Tennessee, the 7th Tennessee, the 14th Tennessee, the 13th Alabama. These are all infantry that are moving down that Chambersburg Pike towards Gettysburg. Lee catches up and asks Heath, he says, well, did you misunderstand my orders? And he says, no, I, I didn't under, misunderstand them. But what was happening was that we encountered what we thought were some militia and some um, uh, dismounted uh, cavalry, but there, it didn't seem like there was many, very many. But again, as I say, regiments started feeding in from the Southerns and Buford's men John Buford. John Buford, born in Kentucky, but raised in Illinois. He is the uh, commander, he's Brigadier General of the 1st Cavalry Division. He's going to have uh, Colonel um, uh, William Gamble and Colonel Thomas Devon in, uh, under his command, all in all, about 2,400 men. He is going to be uh, coming over that far ridge of sem the seminary ridge. Luckily, the Lutheran Theological Seminary is there, and he uses that as an observation post, beautiful observation post, so he can see Heath's division coming down the Chambersburg Pike. All in all, Buford has about 2,400 troopers to counter this. He is going to do this because there's no other Union infantry around. The closest Union infantry is down the Emmitsburg Road, and that is going to be the first corps under, J, under John F. Reynolds. So what Buford decides to do, he decides that he is going to hold those ridges until Reynolds' first corps can arrive. An interesting uh, fact about the Gettysburg battlefield, that is a picture, that is a picture of uh, the Buford Monument right there at the top of um, McPherson's Ridge. Interesting thing is, and you'll see when I go to another slide, uh, Buford is a cavalryman, but he's got a uh, statue where he is standing up. Of course, the uh, picture underneath, that is the actual picture of uh, uh, John Buford. Unfortunately, John Buford, although he's the big hero at Gettysburg on day one, he ends up dying of typhoid in December of 1863. Well, here's one of my favorite paintings right here, and this is him uh, directing the fire of the uh, First Cavalry. Now, a lot of these guys, they're not going to stay on their horses. They're going to be dismounted, and they're going to be behind fences and whatever cover that they can get and their big advantage is they are going to have breech loading carbines that they can shoot. They can shoot those from a prone position, a sitting position. Um, they don't have to stand up and reload them like the Southern uh, infantry have to do. So they can get off about uh, four or five more shots uh, than the, uh, their opponents. So they're able to take quite a toll on Archer's Brigade and uh, later Davis's brigade that's coming down there. Well, I meant to uh, show you this slide right here. This is the Theological Seminary. You can see that cupola up there. That is where Reynolds spent a lot of his time uh, observing, looking out west, uh, down the Chambersburg Pike, watching the arrival of the Confederates. He would also turn around and look the other way and look east and south for the arrival of uh, John Reynolds' first corps. Well, there's a, a lot of interesting facts about Gettysburg. And I have to tell you, my entire life, since I was born in Pennsylvania, 
I have been to Gettysburg scores and scores of times. And I have to tell you that every time I go or every time I have gone or any time I've gone with my wife, I learn something new about the battle. But there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, this is one on the first day's battle. You're going to hear about John Burns. Well, John Burns is a veteran of the War of 1812, believe it or not. And he is a Gettysburg resident. A lot of people know about what happened to him during the battle, but before that, there were actually Confederate stragglers coming through Gettysburg again as they were marching through. And he was actually arresting some of them. This was before the battle of Gettysburg. But on that day, on that first day, up on McPherson's Ridge, he grabs his rifle, as you can see that leaning against the, uh, the door there. Uh, he, he gets his rifle and he comes out. He's actually wounded pretty severely, um, but he does uh, help the Union troops out. And then uh, he actually lived quite a long life after that. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at what is happening. Uh, again, if you saw on that monument, a lot of stuff started happening about 7 o'clock, 7.30. Uh, so we have um, the um, brigade under uh, uh, Johnson Pettigrew coming down. We have the Mississippi troops, the, the Tennessee troops. This is Henry Heath's brigades coming down. Uh, and then we are going to see Reynolds eventually showing up. But a lot of things are going on uh, with that. I didn't know it was going to move around that quickly. Um, but eventually, um, just about 9 o'clock or so, um, Buford is very relieved to see the arrival of uh, John Reynolds, Reynolds, who is a native of uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He is a very, very uh, well thought of uh, general in the Union Army. In fact, he was offered the uh, command of the Union Army. He refused because there was so much infighting going on at the time and he didn't want to be involved in that. He kept his sterling record as a commander of that first corps. Now, here's the interesting thing I wanted to tell you about. See that statue over there, that's a statue of John Reynolds and he is on horseback. So Reynolds eventually shows up and again, Buford is very, very happy to see him because both of um, Buford's brigades, Gamble's um, and uh, Devon's are getting very, very hard pressed at this time, as you can see. And here we are about 930 and you can see Archer's brigade coming in there, pressing in. They have already passed over um, Hare's Ridge. They are bearing down on McPherson's Ridge and uh, Davis's brigade not meeting that much um, resistance on the other side, but a lot of stuff is happening right there on McPherson's Ridge. And what is happening, and this is something that really surprised Henry Heath, is he started getting reports that regular Union infantry was pouring in, and not just any Union infantry. It was going to be the Iron Brigade, the Iron Brigade under Wadsworth and the uh, brigade commander Solomon Meredith. This was a very special brigade. They were tough. Um, they, they had the nickname of the Iron Brigade. These were regiments, three regiments from Wisconsin, one from Michigan and one from Indiana. They were tough, hard fighters. They had uh, done well actually uh, at uh, various battles before that and Archer's Brigade comes in. The Tennesseans, they hit uh, with a, a strong fury right there on McPherson's Ridge, but the uh, Iron Brigade, they hold. And um, actually, he didn't have to do this, but Reynolds rides forward, and he is actually taking personal command of the disposition of these uh, regiments. And there's a, a picture of him right there. Uh, doing that. And you can see the distinctive uniforms of the uh, the Iron Brigade. They have what was known as the Hardy hat uh, that was um, very distinctive. That's how they were able to be identified very quickly. Then about 1015, he turns to talk to someone behind him and he's urging his men to go forward and he is shot. 
this is going to be a terrible, terrible loss. Um, and again, different things uh, evolve over the years. The, the um, story is that Reynolds was shot by a Confederate sniper. Those stories, uh, although popular at one time, have been kind of discredited over the years. And it was going to be more uh, a volley that came from one of those um, regiments in front of, um, in Archer's Brigade. Uh, he was uh, right there with the uh, one Wisconsin regiment, and then he gets hit. But what also happens too on the other side is that the Iron Brigade becomes so incensed that they charge and they basically rip Archer's Brigade to shreds. They capture General Archer. And this is one of the first uh, really um, high general officers that are captured during the, uh, during the war. So what happens now? What happens now, um, the um, commander who is closest is going to be Abner Doubleday. You're going to see him on the right. And I say that there is a squabble after Reynolds was killed. Well, uh, Doubleday, he takes command and he starts trying to uh, organize the defense as uh, best he can. Uh, General Howard, O.O. Howard, he's in charge of the 11th uh, Corps. They are pretty close behind, but they're not there yet. Howard's Corps will arrive uh, around midday and take up positions to the north. And what is going to be happening there is that General Yule, who is coming down from Carlisle, who Early's uh, division is coming uh, in from York, they are coming down uh, in the north. And, and finally, um, well, Doubleday, as I said, he uh, starts realigning these troops. And I want to say probably about uh, 11 o'clock or so, there's a bunch of Mississippi troops that are in a uh, unfinished railroad cut that is a little bit north. And um, up, there's going to be fighting on Oak Ridge. Now, if you don't know where Oak Ridge uh, is, if you've ever heard of the Battle of Gettysburg or you've been there, there is a peace memorial that is on top of Oak Ridge that was put there in 1938 by the Roosevelt administration. It has a perpetual flame uh, that uh, goes all the time. And this is um, Yule's Corps that is coming down. Uh, he starts coming down, although there's a lull right around lunchtime um, that starts to pick up again in the early afternoon. And we have um, Rhodes Division coming down, and then Early's Division is uh, on the way. One of the other divisions of uh, Yule's Corps is um, Johnson's. He is kind of off because he went down one of the wrong roads, and that's going to come in to play in, in, in a little while. But not only in the um, the Herbst Woods on uh, McPherson's Ridge, where we had uh, the Iron Brigade. The Iron Brigade starts to move over, and there's a lot of those Mississippi troops that are in uh, the uh, the railroad cut. But we have uh, the Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana troops. They're grappling with them, not only there, but they start moving over towards that uh, unfinished railroad cut. The Mississippi regiments are trying to use that to flank um, Doubleday. And this is what's happening uh, right about two or three o'clock. As you can see, things are starting to go uh, very hard on the, uh, the Union troops. And eventually um, Howard arrives and there's this instant squabble between him and Doubleday as to who's in command. Uh, they decide that um, Howard is going to be uh, in command. But unfortunately, uh, again, as you can see from this slide, a lot of things are happening. Ewell's pressing down from the north, and Heath is pressing over still from um, the west. He's going to renew his efforts and really start pushing around uh, 2 or 3 o'clock. The 11th Corps, um, as I said, who was uh, under um, Howard, 
they uh, are trying their best to the north there. But as you can see by the blue arrows, they start getting pushed down further and further. Now, there's an interesting story. If you can see on that uh, slide, Barlow's Knoll, that is named after Francis Barlow, uh, Brigadier General Francis Barlow. Now, what happened is that Barlow very, very foolishly pushes his uh, troops out beyond where uh, he can uh, be supported. You're going to hear more about that on the second day by somebody else that does that. But he pushes out there and a large number of his troops are um, shot, wounded, captured, and he himself is wounded very severely. And the way the story goes is the Confederate uh, General John B. Gordon sees him. Now, if you see that picture of John B. Gordon and you think you recognize him, well, that's absolutely true because he was at the Sunken Road at the Battle of Antietam in September 1862. He was wounded five separate times, including one shot to the face, as you can see uh, on the right. Anyway, how the story goes is that Gordon found him, Gordon dressed his wounds and helped him, and Barlow um, told him, he says, I feel like I'm really not going to make it. I'm probably not going to see through the day. And he asked if uh, Gordon could um, deliver his letters through the lines to his to Barlow's wife, who was actually a nurse in the Union camps tending to the wounded. We don't know if this ever really happened, um, but here is something that we do need to look at. This is a very, very famous painting, and this is Brigadier General Barlow speaking with some Confederate prisoners. Now, in the movie Gettysburg, they kind of make you think that these are men from Archer's Brigade, and the guy that's talking to them is Tom Chamberlain, but that is not true at all. This Homer Winslow painting was done in, uh, of a scene in 1864 after Barlow had completely uh, recovered from his wounds. This, these are prisoners from the Battle of Petersburg. So anyway, we go back and the Union troops, they're still fighting. Michigan is still fighting on McPherson's Ridge, but as I said, they keep getting pushed further and further back. The Pennsylvania 151st, they're still fighting. They keep getting pushed further back. Um, and as you can see, you can see the Theological Seminary in uh, the back. What also is happening is, as I mentioned, the Mississippi troops that are trapped in that railroad cut, as you can see, yeah, those are the guys in the black hats again. They're coming over all the way to that railroad cut. And what happens, unfortunately, this is almost an instant replay of what happened at the Sunken Road in Antietam. The northern troops come around and they enfilade or they fire down that line all the way through there. And the Mississippians and the North Carolinians suffer massive casualties. And something interesting, when I was living there uh, and I was living on the outskirts of town, I used to walk down that railroad uh, line all the time, never really thinking about very much. And then after I left, a few years after I left, came a story that somebody found a skeletal arm sticking out of one of those walls of the railroad cut. And there are probably still a lot of bodies that are there that have not been found. Well, the afternoon comes around and things start looking really, really bad uh, for the Union troops. This is about 4 p.m. And as you can see, um, they're getting pushed further and further back. And uh, Doubleday is going, his troops are going to move through Gettysburg. Again, he's uh, division, he's pushing more, uh, and Yule's Corps is pushing down from the north, and eventually the Union troops are going to go streaming through Gettysburg, and then something is going to happen. They are going to go outside of Gettysburg, and up, if you look at the bottom of your uh, picture there, you'll see Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. This is the true high ground of the area in Gettysburg. And these two hills are going to come into extreme uh, play, extreme importance on day two. 
but I usually have a kind of a pop quiz when I do World War II anyway, but I didn't put anyone any in here this time. What I did put in is a very um, disturbing and kind of interesting fact, and that is there were 5,000 horses that were killed during those three days at the Battle of Gettysburg. Nobody really thinks about the horses. They think about the men. They don't think about the horses. And what was the job of that small town after those two armies left? What was that going to do? It was a small town of just about 2,000, a little over 2,000. What were they going to do? They had to gather up all of these horse bodies and they burned them. And there was a pall of awful, hard smoke over the town for weeks and weeks after the battle. So where are we now? Again, as I said, the Union troops, they're streaming through Gettysburg. The Confederates are coming into the town, rounding up uh, prisoners. The first uh, Corps, uh, even though they fight valiantly, they have enormous amount of prisoners that are being taken by the Confederates as they are being overrun. This is a picture of what we're going to see uh, actually at the end of the day, Reynolds and Doubleday, Reynolds uh, Corps under the command of Doubleday, they're pushed through Gettysburg. You can see those arrows. They're pushed through there and they are going to occupy those hills uh, to the south of the town. Well, as far as uh, the casualties are concerned, um, we talked a lot about the Iron Brigade because yes, they did figure very, very prominently. Now, most of those regiments, the Wisconsin regiments, the Michigan regiment, the Indiana regiment, they suffered upwards of 60, 70, 80% casualties. And what I mean by that is that is killed, wounded, and captured, uh, but they fought very hard. The 26th North Carolina, uh, they suffered almost 82% casualties. This is unheard of in our modern time that such high uh, casualties could occur. Uh, but they were driving the Federals back, as you can see, uh, Gettysburg Town in the distance there. So the day starts coming to a close, and Lee takes up residence uh, at his headquarters. And if this building looks familiar to you, those of you who have been to Gettysburg know uh, that this, luckily in the past few years, it was taken over and redone uh, as, a, as a museum, but before it was a Dutch pantry restaurant. And there used to be, if you could see over to the left, there used to be a motor lodge uh, there as well. So now, obviously, Lee has won a great victory on July the 1st. And what he wants to do is position himself in such a way that he can uh, uh, claim complete victory. So he knows that the Union troops are moving up there uh, on the hills south of Gettysburg. And he said, send a message to General Yule to take those hills if practicable. Now, this is where the loss of Stonewall Jackson is felt probably the most. The courier sends those letters to Yule, and Yule is actually quite stunned when he sees these orders because even though the confederates won the day on the first day they suffered a lot of casualties his men were tired from their march and allegheny johnson who was one of the um, divisions that marched off in the wrong direction had they gone with the other divisions of Yule's Corps, they would have been fresh enough that they could possibly have done that. But Rhodes and Early's divisions were played out. So Yule says, no way, I can't do that. But there's a very interesting and possibly uh, not real scene that's in the movie Gettysburg, where the Maryland Confederate, Isaac Trimble, is telling Yule, give me a regiment and I'll take the hill. I'll go there because they haven't really settled in yet. I can go up there. I can knock them off those hills and then we won't have to get butchered tomorrow. And there's silence. And then he says, give me one regiment and I'll do that. I threw that in there. It may be true. Um, but actually the, the truth is Yule did not attack at the end of the day. And I got to throw a comedy scene in here. 
where Lee says, oh, crap, Pete. That was Longstreet's nickname, was Pete. Oh, Pete, you didn't attack. What do we do now? Longstreet said, leave. And the truth of the matter is, if you remember the movie, and actually it is true, Longstreet canceled me, counseled me, or, um, Lee saying, we shouldn't fight here. We should get between the Army of the Potomac and Washington, get between them, and then Meade would have to attack us on ground of our own choosing. Well, Lee's blood was up. He was on a roll. And you have to understand, okay, it was not Lee being difficult about this. This is Robert E. Lee. He just won a fabulous victory at Chancellorsville. He just routed the Union Army on the first day of this battle. There was nothing he felt that his troops could not do. And he said, we'll take care of them tomorrow. Now, the myth about the first day, you don't always hear much about the first day. You hear a little, but not really as much as you're going to hear on the second day, or if you've ever heard on the third day with Pickett's Charge. It was an enormous battle. There were 16,000 men killed, wounded, and missing. A lot of them were Union, but a lot of them were Confederate as well. But even if you take that first day's battle out as its own, it still ranks as one of the bloodiest battles of the entire war. Well, this is what's going to happen at the end of the day. As you can see, this is the new disposition of the Union Army. It is in the shape of a fish hook. It starts at Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill, where you have finally the rest of the Union Army is coming together. Meade finally arrives from the south. You have General Sedgwick, Slocum, Howard, and Hancock of the second Corps, they are forming that fish, fish hook and it goes down and it will eventually sit on Little Round Top. Now, this is, of course, a story that we're going to hear on um, April the 30th. But as the sun is going down on that first day, all the Confederates could hear coming from those hills in the south where the clanging of shovels and picks. The Federals were digging in and they were not going to be dislodged easily. But that is another story. And this is where we're going to end our first day. This is a picture of the sun going down in the west from Little Round Top. The first day's battle was bad, but what happens on the next day is going to make this battle seem like a skirmish. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again on April the 30th.